from thinking outside of the box when it comes to layout design to learning lesser known theories about layout, today's compilation video is surely going to help you master layout design in your designs. So the first thing I'm gonna do is establish a grid for the layout. Now, of course, you should know the dimensions of your document, so maybe it's A3 as an example. Using a grid can inform the position of different elements on your page, and you're going to create a connection between the different elements that make up your design. Now, this can provide a sense of order to your page layout, providing the reader or the viewer with a clear structural reference to fall back on. And this also increases the success of your design. Now the grid you use is entirely up to you, but here are some popular choices. Now column grids utilize, well, pretty much columns, and they do this by creating areas that run down the page or your design. Column grids are typically used in magazines or brochures, but also a lot of websites incorporate them as well. Now in layout design, the areas that are in between the horizontal flow lines or vertical lines are also known as modules. And these areas will be set up for your content or your negative space. More about that later. Now modular grids are similar to column grids, apart from they have rows as well as the columns that go down. Each module is often a square in modular grids, and you don't need to fill up all of the squares in your modules. Again, we're going to see more about that later. Now modular grids are very easy to apply to pretty much any design. So these are the two main grid systems, but there are many more, and you can create hierarchy by just using square modules. But of course there are things like rule of thirds, or even the golden ratio. But yeah, you can use any grid that fits your design, but when you're working on a print project, you have to be mindful of the bleeds and the margins as well. So once you have your grid, let's move on to the next stage. You should have a good idea of what your design's message is, or what you want the design style to evoke. That's all concluded in the research phases that you should be doing. Today's video is about laying those ideas out efficiently. So one of the most effective ways to provide a sense of balance right out of the gates is to choose a single focal point for your design. Now a good example of a solid focal point is the use of a large image as the biggest single element, or a large source of simple typography. The focal point is going to be that thing that pulls in the viewer to your design and that grabs attention with a hook. Without a focal point, a design falls flat and is easily missed or forgettable. The focal point is where the viewer starts the journey on your design, but where do you go after that initial attention grab? So we want to direct the viewer's eye around our designs. And that's because we want them to stay with our work. And then we want to lead them to information that they should consume. This can be achieved by creating little pockets of interest on your designs, or you can use the principle of flow. Good white space is crucial for a good layout, and white or empty space is actually your friend, not your enemy. Now it gives your design room to breathe, and it helps establish which groups of design assets actually belong together, not to mention helping establish hierarchy. And on this crude downloadable template here, we can use grids to establish white space. And I'm actually using a modular grid system here, which seems logical. More about space and layout later in today's video. A repetition can also provide a strong sense of connected design balance to a composition. The idea is that by identifying and reusing a motif or a design element throughout your design layout can provide a reference for the reader so that separate areas feel connected and are part of the same overall composition. So you can do this by repeating shapes or symbols in areas of your design. Or the method I really like to apply is to use colors to connect different aspects of my design together. Now, we're going to learn a few things about layout design that aren't just the basics. We're going to take things to the next level with lesser known techniques and approaches to layout design in graphic design. To start a design from scratch in regard to layout, we need to first ask what? What is the message? Allow me to explain with this design right here. This is a magazine cover design for Wired magazine. But what would you say is the message on this design or the vibe? Well, to me, the message or vibe is about danger, chaos, and importantly, a shock factor aimed at the audience. Now ask yourself this question, will a minimal and clean design express this message? The answer is probably no. A minimal layout here wouldn't help give the impression of chaos or destruction. So instead, a very radical composition that is busy and chaotic has been used on this magazine design. Now let's compare that to this second design here. 
The answer to the question of what is the vibe or the message on this design is of health, simplicity and calmness. The previous layouts that was chaotic and disordered would not be able to express the same sort of message on this design right here. So already in today's video, you can see that layout design is more than just grids and guides, but hey, let's keep going. The next thing you want to do before designing anything is ask yourself, where is the design gonna be shown? If your design is for a business card, then you need to be aware that the limited space on the business card is what you have to work with. But if you're designing something for a website, things change again in terms of how you will structure the composition because of the size of your workspace. How the audience views and interacts with the design depends on the shape and the size of the thing your design is going to be put onto. Now that's very, very important to keep in mind. The third question that can determine your layout on a design is what is the purpose of the design? Is it to inform somebody of an event or something else? Or maybe is your design trying to sell something like this design is right here? You see, when you ask what is the design trying to do, you can then make very specific design decisions in terms of your layout. This design wants to make a sale, so it first tries to grab the attention of the viewer, and it does this with a bold colorful background and a focal point of the guy at the very top. Then the designer wants to take the viewer on a visual journey down to the bottom of the design where they click the shop now button and a sale is clinched. So the path to the button is straightforward and is cleanly laid out. However, if we take a look at this design, we see things are very different in terms of layouts. This design is trying to shock people into quitting smoking. And so the message needs to be very striking and very stark. As a result, the layout is very minimal so the viewer gets the idea very easily and the main focal point is highlighted really, really immensely. The visual journey or the direction isn't as important here as the design is just about shocking and some information. The message and reason behind the design are intertwined as you can actually probably see. So here are a pair of meme sunglasses and we want to make a design that advertises and showcases these in a magazine. So the first question is, what is the message or what is the vibe of this design? Well, I want to show off the sunglasses to the viewer and the viewers are actually going to be younger people considering the kind of product this is. So the vibe is going to be bold and pretty trendy. Second question, where is the design going to be shown? This design is going onto a single page of a magazine. And so with that in mind, I'm thinking of a downward journey from top to bottom because A4 is quite narrow. Lastly, what do we want the design to achieve? Well, that's appreciation for the sunglasses and a potential sale. So I'm gonna try and attract the viewers with the product at the very top. And so I've split the layout into two halves. A bright and bold color will play into the current 2022 meme sector audience. And then we can lay the product into the section at quite a large scale. Again, this is the hero of the design. It's the focal point. So I want people to be attracted to this area. And this is also where people are going to start their journey at the very top of the page. We also can take into consideration the bleed or padding of our composition. But these are more technical layout matters that have been discussed in previous videos here at Photographics. But next, to continue the bright colour scheme that's going to appeal to the younger generations who are into this kind of product, I have three shapes here that continue the downward moving layout. And within those squares, the text content that gives some selling points to the product. And then lastly, at the bottom where the viewer finishes their journey, the trigger or call to action that's going to encourage people to want the product even more. And below that, it's the traffic destination information that will actually drive the people away from the magazine to the website. Because this design is selling something, I wanted to keep it minimal and open to make sure the product is obvious, and then also the call to action is just as obvious. As you can see, Knowing the vibe or the message, where the design is going to be used, and what the intention of the design is, really can dictate your design layout. Like I said before, space is insanely important when it comes to layout design, and so we're going to learn some really cool techniques and a few tips when it comes to using that space on your designs. I'm sure most of us know about white space and negative space in graphic design, but do you get confused or lost when it comes to actually applying these things to your designs in real time? And we're going to be looking at design principle of space so we can end up with beautiful designs that wow clients. So before we look at some real life examples, it's important to understand the benefits of mastering space in your designs. Firstly, if you utilize space properly, it's going to enhance visual hierarchy, which is another very important principle in the communication of your design. 
Secondly, space prevents your designs from being cluttered and cramped. That's not something you want in your designs. Space also simply adds style and elegance to your designs if done correctly, and that's what we're going to talk about soon. But also when used correctly, space also emphasizes bonds between visual elements. Essentially, it just enhances proximity. This is useful for allowing your designs to make sense. When designing something in regard to the use of space, firstly ask yourself, what is the content you're working with? What has the client given you? It's important to distinguish between macro white space and micro white space at this point. Macro white space is the large expanse areas of nothingness that exists on your design, whereas the micro white space are the areas of smaller sections of nothingness between lines of text, paragraphs of text, and closely packed together design objects. For example, if you're working on a design where the client has given you reams and reams of text to work with, you're not going to be focusing much on macro white space, simply because you didn't have much of it to work with. Your whole vision and approach for that design should then shift to focusing on using more micro white space effectively. However, you will still have elements of macro white space to consider, albeit a lot less. Now, if you find yourself in a situation on a project where you're able to work with both micro and macro white space, it's important to consider the message of the design and also the target audience. You want to find the right balance of micro and macro white space for targeted people who will be viewing it. If the design is a poster targeting mainly young business professionals who will view the design whilst briskly walking along the subway to work, you want to tip the balance towards using more macro white space. This is so your design remains easy to digest and recognizable at a first glance. Having lots of macro white space will just create emphasis and hierarchy on the focal point, making the design more noticeable. One rule of thumb that you can use is that more macro white space can suggest minimalism, modernity, and luxury. While if the balance is shifted more to micro white space, the design can be seen as more informative and serious. Things do go deeper than just macro and micro white space, however. We can enhance our designs with the use of passive white space and active white space. Passive white space refers to the micro white space that helps legibility and the aesthetics of a layout. That is, without guiding the viewer in terms of structure and viewing order. Active white space, on the other hand, relates to helping the viewer move through your designs in order and structure. If we take a look at this example of a paragraph, this design has poor use of micro white space. It's essentially just not even that legible. If we add in some passive white space, we can now read it properly and the viewer has more of a pleasant experience. But we can go further and apply active white space to control the order and the movement of the reading experience. Things are now broken down into digestible chunks, which helps the viewer move between each part of the design easily and this ensures they will remain on your design for longer periods of time. To summarize, when considering the use of space on your designs, it should always be legible whatever you're designing. Also, unless the brief specifically calls for it, you don't want the viewer to feel cramped and have a tough time navigating your design. You then need to consider the balance of micro and also macro white space that you're going to use. Things that determine this are the message of your design, the content given by the client, the target audience, and the context of the design in real life situations. Use space to enhance other principles such as hierarchy and proximity. And then lastly, consider passive and active white spaces. If you didn't actually fully understand all of today's video, go back and watch it again so you can fully digest the content. Also look for white space in existing designs and how they're being used. Is the white space there to guide a viewer around the design? Is it used to help things be more legible? So let's dive into some theories that are actually attached to layout design. And these are really important for you to build constructive and effective layouts in your projects. I bet you've heard the graphic design principles of contrast, hierarchy, and so on. What about visual tension or Rudolf Arnheim's 
structural net. And today you can learn all about some lesser known theories and you will see just how hugely powerful they can be to you as a graphic designer. One thing that took me a long time to understand the importance of was the four main aspects of visual movement. After all, people do engage with our designs using their eyes. Being able to set up a design where you actively take your audience on a journey is a master skill. And it does go deeper than you think. The four aspects of this are movement, shape of element, structure, and subject matter. Yes, this might seem a tiny bit confusing or technical, but trust me, we're going to look at some real life examples in today's video. Let's look at shape of element first. This is where a designer purposely uses a specific shape on a design that has an axis or line running through it and is carried through the entire shape. This causes the viewer to actually follow it along the design. On this website here, you can see that the beige peachy rectangle is actually carrying the viewer's eye along it. And then to the information on the left. This isn't a mistake, it's actually carefully planned out. Then we have this poster here. The designer has added red slanted rectangles that mirror the viewer's eye as it goes from the top left, across and down the design to the right. Basically, the designer has laid out a path for the viewer to go along visually speaking, and they would do that subconsciously because going against it would just feel uncomfortable. The second point is subject matter, which is pretty similar to shape of elements, but it's more about visual cues. Think of fingers pointing or fists punching or eyes looking in one direction. As seen here on this poster, the arm is directing the attention up towards the bird. And on this website here, this woman's hand is literally directing attention to the main bit of information. But what about the third point, movement? So on a design, you can have design elements that work together to create a sense of movement. An example is this poster where various different shapes create a sense of movement upward. And then the fourth one we mentioned, structure. This is where Rudolf Arnheim's structural net comes into play. It sounds pretty weird, I know, but the theory suggests that every canvas has a structure even before design elements and assets go onto it. Crazy, maybe, but let's take a look at this in more depth. The structure starts with a point of focus, centrally so. However, the theory suggests that it's a tiny bit higher than the exact center, and this is where most eyes will just naturally land. Then we have the axes that run from corner to corner, and the points along these axes that are actually midway between the center and the corners also attract attention. These midway points can then be connected with vertical and horizontal lines, which create additional axes of visual force. So according to Rudolf and his theory, the eyes will actually follow these paths and they will actually land on the points of interest or focus. You may very well be able to see this in action in real life. And when you do start thinking about this, you begin to see designs very differently indeed. The next theory that is lesser known among graphic designers is visual tension. Like with a lot of theories in today's video, you won't see them on every single design and sometimes designers do them without even realizing. However, they are very easy to get wrong and we're soon going to see just that in action. But yeah, visual tension can be thought of as anxiety or just visual anxiety. It can be achieved when design elements are positioned alongside each other that disrupt the viewer's experience. Now you can think of this as creating disharmony to Rudolph's structural net. And that's where design elements totally go against the channels or paths that he theorizes. Looking on this website design here, we can see multiple elements that come together and point to random places on a design. It just looks simply unorganized and uncomfortable to look at. Simply because it's disregarding those paths that we just saw. Instead, we can remove random movement and direction from shapes pointing in all directions and create one solid point of focus like on this second design here. Now here's a very simple and effective but forgotten about theory. The theory of overall design composition direction. The three main directions for a composition can be horizontal, vertical or diagonal. Horizontal compositions are more calming and stable. Now I don't mean kind of landscape designs, I just mean the directional movement of the design layout. Then vertical designs are good to show balance, boldness and alertness. Then finally, the diagonal compositions will help to suggest movement and action. 
We can see here on this first design how everything just feels calm and still. The directional movement of the design as a whole is horizontal. And then for the second compositional layout, we have vertical. Here we see more vertical direction of the form, with some slight diagonals with the red strike marks on the left. The design seems more bold, more striking and impacting. Then finally, the diagonal design. Notice also how this brochure has used the Satori colour of yellowy orange. And that's a typical colour for action and movement. It's no coincidence that the diagonal layout is matched to this. It's kind of like a double whammy of psychological traits on this design. As you should be aware of now, movement is a powerful tool not only to direct a viewer around your design, but also to make them feel comfortable or uncomfortable, depending on what you want them to feel. But as we've just seen, it's possible also to set a base feeling or emotion simply by looking at the layout and directional movement of your composition. Never ever underestimate the power of this stuff. Now layout design is really important, but it's pretty useless if you don't master these five principles in graphic design. To learn more, just click that video on screen and until next time guys, design your future today. Peace.